Hi there, everybody. I just wanted to do a brief lecture here on covalent compounds versus ionic compounds and how we tell the difference as far as naming. So many students, when they get to this point, will often confuse the naming process and they will either forget the "-ide", suffix that goes at the end of the second portionality of a compound, or they'll forget the prefixes in the covalent version, um, or they'll use them inappropriately in the ionic version. So when we get ready to look at this, I just wanted to sort of break it down as far as ionic versus covalent and what could you expect with the naming, and we'll use a few examples here. So let's start with ionic so that we can get a good understanding of how to name ionic compounds. Now, when we name ionic compounds, you are going to, first of all, you want to know what an ionic compound is. So we would define it, there's multiple ways, but usually for ionic, we talk about a metal and a non-metal. Now, the reason that this is classified as an ionic compound is there's usually a large difference in the electronegativity values. So when the electronegativity difference between the two atoms involved in bonding starts to go above about a 2.0, then at that point you are starting to look at ionic type of behavior, a transfer of electrons instead of a sharing of electrons, which would be covalent when we're looking at covalent bonds. So when I find metals and non-metals, those examples are going to be ionic. So how do I name ionic compounds? Well, when you get ready to name them, you're going to name them with just the name of the metal, no matter how many of that metal is currently there. Okay, And then for the second portionality, whatever you're pairing with your metal, your non-metal, you are going to write the name of the non-metal and then you're going to drop the very last portion of the non-metal name and you're going to add the term "-ide". All right, now it's very important to note here that when we're naming ionic compounds, so let's just remind ourselves we're talking about ionic here, when we are naming ionic compounds there are going to be no numbers associated with the name, so none of the number prefixes. So what do I mean by that? Think about the name carbon dioxide, right? Dioxide meaning two oxygen. So you do not find any of that naming portionality uh, with the prefixes when you do ionic compounds. They are absent from ionic compounds. That's the way that the nomenclature works. So when we start looking at this, for example, if I have sodium chloride, okay, most people have seen this compound, they know what sodium chloride is, but look, we're following the rules. Sodium, right, because that's the name of the metal that we have here, and then chloride. It's not sodium chlorine, because chlorine is the name of the element, the nonmetal. so it's sodium chlor, and then I drop the ene for ide. And this can take a little bit of practice if you're not familiar with it, but after you start hearing terms over and over again, you should get used to where you're going to add the ide here. All right, so if I were to continue on some other examples, I could have AlBr3. So this would be aluminum, because that's the metal. And then, again, some students get confused here, and they would put tribromide. It is not tri. We drop the prefixes when we're doing ionic compounds. So in this case, we're just talking about bromide even though there are three of them, right? Now, I will have other lectures. In fact, I think I have older ones, but I'm going to do a more updated one on when you know how to pick out the numbers that you do here. So how come I know it's one aluminum and three bromines when I create aluminum bromide? I'll have a separate lecture on that. This is really just focusing on the naming portionality of these compounds, all right? So I could also have something, for instance, like this, Ca3N2. So the name for this, get the metal, calcium, and then instead of nitrogen, I'm going to use nitride, okay? So nitride is the correct answer there for the second part. I could have something like this, and the metal here is magnesium, and the proper nonmetal is going to be oxide. Now, what happens if I come into a situation like this, NaNO3? Well, this NO3 group right here is known as a polyatomic anion. So it gets grouped as one entire cluster. And we would not call this a nitride oxide. 
we would not call it nitride or oxide respectively, an NO3 group is known as a nitrate. And there's a whole list of these. You can have nitrite, nitrate, phosphate, sulfate, sulfite, so on and so forth, perchlorate, okay? And you're going to need to know those. You'll need to study your um, polyatomic anions and their names. But when you have it, you just list it as the polyatomic anion. So NO3 is a nitrate, so this would be referred to as sodium, because I still label the name here. But when it is a polyatomic anion, I just put the name of the polyatomic anion, which in this case is nitrate. And that's important because if you look, when I had Cl, Br, right, and all of the rest of these, all of these right here were mono nonmetals. And what I mean by mono, I may have had more of them, for instance, when I had three bromines, right, in the aluminum bromide. But what I mean is all I had was bromine. I didn't have nitrogen and oxygen, or I didn't have bromine and chlorine. It was just one nonmetal that I was utilizing there. So that's important. This eyed portionality is going to be when we have the mono nonmetals that we're picking out. As soon as we start coupling these, okay, so another one, for instance, you could have phosphate. Right? So this would have a minus charge, this would have a three minus charge, and this is known as phosphate. So if I were to pair something with the phosphate, let's say sodium again, right? So if I, in this case, did sodium with a PO4, then the name of this would be sodium phosphate. Again, I'm simply utilizing the name of the polyatomic at the end when I get ready to name that, if it goes beyond, if it's multiple nonmetals that are sort of strung together like that. All right, so that is ionic. That's how you would name ionic compounds. Now, what about covalent compounds? So for covalent compounds, we run into a similar technique, but we need to add some prefixes, and there's a, an exception to our rule here. So when we get ready to do covalent, it's going to be, and uh, let's define it, a covalent is usually a nonmetal right, bonded with another non-metal. So one of the examples I mentioned earlier in this video was most people are familiar with this, right? Even people who would not be in a chemistry class, if you turn around and you talk to them about carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide, they know what you're talking about on an everyday basis, okay? And so notice that we still list the first one, so it's carbon, and then I put dioxide here, right? or for CO, I have carbon, right? Everybody's familiar with this, with the alarms that we have nowadays, because we have to be careful of this stuff, carbon monoxide. And so when you start working with these, you can see that the, the general methodology that I'm bringing up here is that nonmetal one, okay? So we'll just abbreviate NM for nonmetal. So nonmetal number one is going to be the proper name and then nonmetal two is going to still contain the eyed portionality. See that it's not dioxygen, it's dioxide, right? Carbon dioxide. So it's the name of nonmetal one plus the name of nonmetal two with the eyed portionality brought in. So without anything else so far, this looks just like we would have expected for the ionic. We name the metal and then we name the nonmetal with the eyed. Here we're just naming nonmetal one as nonmetal one, whatever it is, in this case carbon, and then nonmetal two with the eyed. So we have oxide in these cases. Now one of the things that we need to keep in mind here is that we will always insert a prefix based on the number here. So whenever I'm getting ready to work with this, I need to add a prefix in front of the second nonmetal, no matter how many there are, right? Even if there's one, I see carbon monoxide here. And it turns out that you didn't see it in the examples I gave above, but you also add a prefix in front of the first name, except, okay, so the exception here is going to be if it's mono. So if it's mono, we do not utilize that. We just turn around and say carbon dioxide. We don't call it monocarbon 
uh, dioxide. So if I continue and I give you other examples here, what happens if I have one like this, N2O4? Well, now it's going to be di-nitrogen because I have two of those now, right? It's not just one anymore. So the mono exception rule falls off. And then when I get ready for the second portionality here, I have four, so it's going to be tetra oxide because tetra is the prefix for the four there. And then you could have penta, hexa, right? You could climb all the way up, you could have octa. And so you can use these different prefixes in order to classify this. So another one, let's see if we add SF6, right? This would be sulfur, no need for a prefix there because it's only one sulfur. And then on top of that, I would have hexafluoride. Right? And when I'm working with this, notice that the hexa goes in front of the F there when I'm attempting to work with that. So what would happen if I had B2H6, for instance? Well, this is boron. I would have diboron, because I've got two of these now, and it would be hexa hydride. So it's not hydrogen, it would be called a hydride because of that second portionality there, right? So what would happen if I had CCl4? Well again I'm back to one of the examples where there would be a mono, so I would just call it carbon, and then I could call this tetrachloride. Alright, so hopefully you're getting the hang of this. Um, I can give you one more uh, common reagent is PBr3. So in this case, I would have phosphorus and it would be tribromide. All right, so that's really all there is to it. Remember, for the ionics, you should never have any prefixes involved in them, and that's for a metal and a nonmetal. When you get to the covalent and you have the two nonmetals, the first nonmetal will have a prefix unless it's mono, and we've seen plenty of examples like that here. And if it's not mono, add the prefix. The second portionality, the second nonmetal, no matter what, you add the prefix, and then you continue with the eyed type of addition that you were working with back when you were naming ionic. So hopefully everybody found that useful. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. It really helps to support the channel. And I will leave links down in the description. You can also support the channel by checking out our online courses uh, that we offer at Udemy. So thank you very much for learning with us, and we'll see you guys next time.